Today we're going to do an exploration. The title of this message is Jesus, our High Priest. But I always want to show you that this involves you and I because an alternative sermon that I, title that I had for this message is Priests of the Most High God. If Jesus is the High Priest, who are all those other priests? And what does it look like? And on the Day of Atonement, historically, the high priest did everything. The ancient Israelites just stood still and did nothing. The high priest went into the Holy of Holies. He did everything. And for us today in this Western modern society, the idea of priesthood, even under the terms of the New Covenant, is not fully understood. The first time that we encounter priest is in Abraham's day. Did you know that? Long before the ancient Israelites and the Levitical priesthood under Moses, it was in Abraham's day. And, and the priest of the time was named Melchizedek and he was known as having no genealogy that preceded him. And he was the king of Salem as well as a priest. He brought out bread and wine with Abraham. Abraham tithed to him. And when we read the book of Hebrews, we realise that this priesthood, this image bearer of God in Christ that Abraham knew so well is mentioned again in the book of Hebrews. Very irrelevant for us. What I want to do this morning, as you know, my voice has been recovering all this week, and I, you know, so I'm going to ask Joshua to give me a bit of help today. We have some scriptures. I'm, we're going to read them. We're going to share the podium together for a few minutes. And we're going to read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, I think chapter 10, six sections of scripture, and then I'm going to conclude with a few words. So Joshua, would you like to join us this morning? And we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We're going to drop down to Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, the first 10 verses. And he's going to carry on the idea of the role of the high priest that we just read who passed into the heavens and the role of the priests on this earth that foreshadowed and their, their inadequacy in ministering as Jesus does. Thank you, Joshua. Hebrews 5, 1 to 10. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honour for himself, but only when, when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest, but he was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As said also in another place, you are the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who is able to save him from death. And he was heard because of, because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he had suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. When you, come, when you reflect on that, that's a very powerful statement that really recognises, ties in Jesus with Melchizedek. And he, Jesus Christ, stands tall as the centre narrative of all of Scripture. And the work of Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek, 
falls on Jesus' shoulders. We'll continue now from Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 19 and 20, and, um, and then we'll jump in straight into chapter 7, verses 14 to 17. So we're going to have chapters, Hebrews 6, 19 to 20, if you've got your Bible there, and then we'll jump to chapter 7, 14 to 17. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, have become high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For it is evident that our Lord, in chapter 7, verse 14, that evident that our Lord has des- was descended from Judah, and in connection with the tribe, with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises, in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This sets up the framework for Jesus' work, Jesus' ministry, and his ongoing ministry today because he is a priest forever. When you consider that, you consider the reality of what was saying here, this is so much higher and so much bigger than the Levitical priesthood. See, the Le- Levitical priesthood had to change their priests regularly because they died. They were of the tribe of Levi, they had a set term of duty, and they died. They had to offer sins for themselves, offerings for their own sins, and they offered the sins of the people. But Jesus' ministry in the order of Melchizedek is just simply so much higher. It's not of the tribe of Levi, not of the tribe of Judah. It's so far beyond that, so much bigger. Uh, we're going to continue now with Re- Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. Uh, thanks again, Josh. But this one was made a priest when, with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are the priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantee of a better covenant. The guarantor, sorry. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the utmost utmost, those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. If it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, he has no need like those high priests who offer sacrifices daily, first for their own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. The law appoints men and their weaknesses as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we wonder about the patterns that exist in Scripture and the patterns that exist in the Levitical priesthood. And sometimes people compare pastors and elders today with the Levitical priesthood. Brothers and sisters, this is much bigger than pastors and elders. Today we're going to see that all of us are called into priesthood. Every man, woman and child, our ultimate destination and calling is to be priests. And we're going to examine what a priest does, um, what his role is, um, and how Jesus foreshadows that role on our behalf. Final reading here today is from Hebrews chapter 10. And again, I'll ask Joshua to give us a bit of a hand from verse 19. Verse 19 of chapter 10. Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
The book of Hebrews really takes us into the heart of Jesus, shows us his divinity as the Son of God, and shows us his role of high priest interceding on our behalf. You and I are all equipped for a life of eternity. We know that we are the clay models, that this is not all that there is. And you and I go through highs and lows and difficulties and circumstances, and we read of Jesus that he was made perfect through his suffering. And some of us go through seasons of suffering in our lives when it becomes very, very difficult. You know, Jesus is our good shepherd. He tells us in scripture, I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. He says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will be with you to the end of this age. And so God allows us to be tested. He allows us to be tried. He allows us to be squeezed into circumstances that we feel uncomfortable with. Whether it's the death of a loved one. Whether it's being without a voice for seven days. And he wants us to know that he is adequately up to the task. And he makes some extraordinary promises. He says, I have an inheritance for you. And you are saved by grace through faith, but you have a responsibility to respond to that saving grace. And that inheritance is all things. And we're asked to participate. And we participate, first of all, by receiving Jesus, by believing in his name. And we know that that offer is only through Jesus. Jesus signed the deal that redeems us from Satan, from the realm of his influence, into into, into the realm of promise. Your name is written in the book of life as a crown of glory waiting for you. But sometimes when you're feeling miserable, down and distracted, it's hard to understand and to hold to mind that there is this transcendent reality. And so Jesus, we are sons of God, children of God. And it's just not just that, like, what is the future if, if we are given all things? Is it not just a season of idleness for eternity? We will become, as scripture says, a kingdom of priests. And priests have work to do, they have roles to do, and the most preeminent among this priesthood is Jesus. We explore that today. The book of Hebrews sets the framework on a theological level. Today I want to draw the dots that take what was written 2,000 years ago in the book of Hebrews and elsewhere and apply it in our lives. We are going to be rewarded on that last day. As Jesus says, I am coming quickly My reward is with me to give to everyone according to what he has done. And so Jesus is going to commend us to becoming priests. Now a priest has two functions. What is the function of a priest? We have to look at history to understand. We have to look to Jesus to know. Number one, a priest of God conveys, thus says the Lord, taste and see that God exists. God is righteous, holy and true. I believe him. So a priest is a witness to the glory of God. He conveys God's word. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you speak God's words. The second thing that a priest does, not only does he convey with the divine template from heaven to earth, he takes what's on earth and represents it before God. He prays for the sick. He prays for the ill. You pray for one another. You pray for the body of Christ. You cry out to God in heaven and you pray for our children, our grandchildren, our young mums and dads. And so we intercede to God on behalf of those we love. That's the role of a priest. Conveying what God has, thus says the Lord. One way communication and another communication coming up to God with requests for others. And we see priesthood existing throughout the scriptures. The first place it appears in Abraham's day under the order of Melchizedek. This king priest figure with no genealogy set a powerful precedent. Then there's the Levitical priesthood. Out of the 12 tribes of Israel, Levi, the the, the children of Levi, the Levites, were assigned the job of priests. And finally, where the priest is mentioned again, is in the book of Hebrews, where Jesus becomes our high priest. Now, the investiture of priesthood involves a high degree of responsibility. It involves a lot of stewardship and involves a lot of sacrifice. Now, a priest does not serve his own interests. He conveys exactly what God says and 
then he conveys intercession for all those around him. He prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You're able to love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you because you're praying for them. You know, it's like an ambassador. An ambassador is a representative servant. An ambassador acts on behalf and serves as a behalf of a greater entity. He doesn't have an opinion in that sense. He only speaks like a man under authority. And he reflects that authority and he attests to be under that authority. The ambassador for Australia to any other country in the world does not speak his own opinion. If he has an opinion during his time of service, he doesn't speak that opinion. And you and I then, if Christ dwells in us, then your and my order of talking and living and breathing is of a higher level of goodwill and graciousness, presuming the best and only speaking and acting according to a higher will. In fact, what we reflect, being people under authority, is the Father's righteousness, is the preeminence of the glory of Christ, his will, his purpose, his word. So a priest is someone full of mercy and grace and compassion, and they come before the Father of grace and mercy to receive grace and mercy for themselves and for all around them. You know, it's advocacy. It's advocacy at the highest level. It's intercession and intervention. The God who knows us wants us into covenant relationship with him. And so Jesus Christ today intercedes for you and I. And the way he represents us is by his blood. He paid the price for your and my redemption to cover our sin. You know, it's only Jesus that bridges the gap between heaven and earth. Have you ever thought of that? Jesus is the preeminent high priest that connects us to the Father. And he did that by sacrificing his life, perfect and sinless, in place of you and me. And so we can come before heaven and earth. At the moment, heaven and earth are separated. Sin cannot dwell in the heavenlies. And so heaven and earth are separated. Jesus came down, paid the price of sin, and heaven and earth are just a little bit closer. You and I, your and my citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven. We are citizens of God's kingdom today, even though we have Australian nationality. But heaven and earth is going to be reunited. Heaven and earth is going to intersect where man will be with God and God will be with man forever. And this story is narrated in the name of Jesus and by his blood. And so Jesus Christ ongoing says, I know what it's like to have depression and suffer because you know your death is coming. I know what it's like because I spoke everything into existence. And I know what it's like to see the broken, the lame, the leprous, the blind, the demonic, freed, but there was a cost, and that cost was Jesus' blood. But after Jesus was resurrected, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Heaven and earth came closer on the day that Jesus died and rose again. And since Jesus' death, you and I are priests in preparation, planning, living our life as priesthood, that we convey by our witness, thus says the Lord, and that we spend our energies praying and interceding and doing those things, feeding the hungry, glass of water to the thirsty, providing the physical needs and interceding on our knees. Not only that, you and I are invited to come before God, before the Holy of Holies, not through a, a Levitical priest, not through somebody, human figure on this earth, but directly before the throne of Holy of Holies because Jesus' atoning blood was complete and comprehensive. It left no stone unturned to reconcile us to our Heavenly Father. And as a result of being made right with God, Jesus is going to infer his reward of priesthood onto the faithful. I want to read from Revelation 1, verse 5, if you've got your Bible there. Because Revelation ex echoes that in three places where you and I are made by Christ into a kingdom of priests. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. 
from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. What's next? And made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. Jesus makes us priests. And how did he do that? When he took the cup of the new covenant, he said, I will not drink it of a new with you again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. And the wedding supper of the Lamb after Jesus' return is symbolic of the continuation of the unfinished business. And the Day of Atonement from Hebrew antiquity under the Christology it shows is the work of the high priest finishing the work that he began, made us a kingdom, priests to God his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Wow. Revelation 5 verse 9, just a few verses on. Now this is the angelic host. They sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Verse 10, listen to this. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on earth. So the, the elders in heaven the spiritual beings of great authority rejoice before God because you and I are made priests. Let's jump to Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Jesus says, all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to a resurrection of life. First resurrection. Blessed and holy in Revelation 20, verse 6 is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. You know, out of the great tribulation comes an innumerable multitude of people from every tribe and language and nation and ethnic group, repentant of their sins, dressed in white, worshipping God. But they will need help because they've lived in an age of deception, the beast, the false prophet, all the plagues and suffering on this age, and there's a vast section of humanity that repents. Who are going to mentor and teach and encourage and heal? You and I are being prepared for such a day. We are. There is a future role, and we cannot barely comprehend it living in our small homes and distracted by the issues of life in 2024. The Lord hasten that day. Brothers and sisters, every time we pray and we intercede on behalf of another, every time we testify of Jesus to another, we are reflecting the high calling of priesthood. Did you ever think of that in those terms? We are being prepared and equipped now. There's a sense of stewardship there. Even today, you know, Jesus said, become perfect, even as your heavenly Father's perfect. That we are called to speak and do everything in Jesus' name. And as Peter says, one last word before I die, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour. We know he's our high priest. Moreover, Jesus says to us, if you want to follow me, and we know Jesus now is high priest, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross. Deny yourself. What does deny yourself mean? You go through a day like today, denying yourself. You say, Lord, Jesus, you do everything, but I'm going to honour you by standing still today. I'm going to honour you, Lord Jesus, my high priest. The greatest act of priesthood was when Jesus gave his life for us. He acted and interceded on our behalf. You know, the book of Hebrews says, and I won't quote it here, he says, who for the joy set before him despised the... Um, endured the cross, despising the shame, and now is set at the right hand of God the Father. There was joy for Jesus. He wasn't only now the one and only Son of God. He's always preeminent. He was begotten. You and I are children and sons of God by faith and called into priesthood. He is the high priest, and we are called to priesthood. And the most important act that now awaits for the high priest by way of intercession and acknowledgement is to confess your name 
and my name before the Father and all his angels. Only Jesus, the high priest, can do that. The angels that sing about the priesthood of all of us, they're they're waiting for that. All of creation yearns and longs for the revealing of the sons of God, the sons of God. Today, you may be tested, challenged, perplexed and struggling, but there's a glory to be revealed out of that. Pure, beautiful gold comes out of furnace fire. And our, ta- our, ta- our task today in this testing is to recognise that we have stewardship today. You know what the Apostle Paul said? He was distracted by serving of the tables and, and bringing out the food for the Hebrew widows and the Gentile widows. And he said, get us seven men to serve as stewards. I must give my life to two things, preaching the word and to prayer. Paul understood that he needed to preach the word of God and he needed to intercede on behalf of the other. What he talked about was priesthood. And what will give us the most satisfaction is when we come before the throne of grace in the role of a priest today, wearing no badge except by the blood of Jesus, to come before the Holy of Holies and the investiture of priesthood given to us is not by our own merit or will or good works. It's because of Jesus, our high priest, conferring upon us his gift of righteousness. Brothers and sisters, don't let anyone steal your crown of glory for we are all destined to become priests of the Most High God in the footsteps of Jesus, our High Priest. I hope we find strength and encouragement today on a day when we put aside some of the physical trappings that make life more luxurious and make us feel that we stand strong. Brothers and sisters, we stand purely in the bread of life, the blood of Jesus, for the awesome great promises awaiting us. 